this week on The Pier, we dip into the world of rock stardom and rock musicianship. Mark King, formerly of the chart-topping band Level 42, is widely considered to be the best bass guitarist of his generation. We tracked him down to the Isle of Wight, where he lives, and was in fact born, to find he's on the verge of a solo career. We start this film with a bit of an indulgence. Check out the fingerwork on this. For many, Level 42 were just a pop group, but to fans and those in the music business, they were also one of the most respected bands in the industry for sheer musicianship. For Mark King, it was a typical rags to riches tale. He worked as a milkman on the Isle of Wight while playing drums in a couple of local bands. It took a move to London and a unique style of bass playing before success showed itself. Level 42 played up to 100 gigs a year, many in top European venues. They even opened for Madonna. The band's now split, and Mark King, at 37, is going solo. I'm going to see if I can pick up a deal with uh, one of the major labels for putting out the new album. Now, this is a second sort of option for me, really, because I'm also quite keen to see the project through in its entirety on my own. The downside of that option is that you don't have the, the weight, the clout that a record company can offer in terms of promotion. So I'm keen to get up to town now to see if I can find a sympathetic major label that might be interested in getting on board really. It's just natural to him to pick up instruments just to play. He has a tremendous amount to say, and I don't think we've seen the half of it yet. I think that now he's working on a solo project. Um, this will finally give him a chance to really blossom. The really remarkable thing about him as a musician is that he's entertaining, talking about things other than himself. He's the pop star that you would send to meet your mother and know that your mother would be enormously impressed with him. ride where we are sitting now you used to boast three or four great venues for bands to be playing so you, you could have a choice of three or four bands on per night in any one place and it was something that I noticed when I, I finally did come back to the island in 1988 after being in London for 10 years or so um, was that so many of the venues had gone and there was no sort of grassroots way for, for young musicians to really be you know performing and doing things and that's all any kid needs is for someone to get excited with them on their behalf about what it is here you know at cows high school there was graham holmes who was fantastically enthusiastic for you i think that he was at a superior level because he could rearrange traditional sounds in a new way and therefore produced a new sound and any new composer any new group searches for something new all i ever wanted to be was a drummer i can remember at nine you know the first time that the crowd absolutely loved that i did this drum solo and it was such a phenomenal feeling of having an audience respond to something that you did that i can remember after the concert 
which was at Carisbrook High School at the time. It would have been called secondary modern school, I suppose, then. Uh, so getting home at about six o'clock in the evening after the concert and, and lying in front of the fire, and, because my dad was saying, wow, that nipper stole the show. Wasn't he great, Bridget? That's my mum. And I just sat there all night saying, oh, I was really good, wasn't I? How great was I? Wasn't it great? And so, you know, sadly, began this terrible ego massaging trip that I've been on ever since. Of, uh, but it was wonderful, you know, to have the mum and dad that support you like that. You know, I was lucky enough that by the time I was 11, I had, uh, uh, when we were over at my granny's house one day, uh, Annie and Martin Cave dropped by, and they, they were in a group called Pseudo Foot, a real group. That's a great name, isn't it? Pseudo Foot. And uh, I'd sat in with them on a talent show one afternoon at uh, a holiday camp. And they remember this, and when their drummer left, they came and said, did I want to join? So I, I was really lucky to be able to join a, a working group, uh, a serious group, doing covers, of course. And then, then uh, the most amazing experience is by... My mum and dad had bought a new TV, and, and in sort of pushing the wrong button, I changed over to BBC Two and saw the Mahavishnu Orchestra in concert with... Uh, John McLaughlin on guitar, and he had this twin neck guitar, and he was dressed all in white, and he had short hair, and he looked incredibly spiritual like. And it was just absolutely mind blowing. They weren't bothered, they weren't fanning around with things like singing. They'd just gone on and played, but the most incredible music. Maybe only a year after this, uh, uh, um, the Mahavishnu Orchestra, and its second incantation, and we were doing a show over in Portsmouth at Portsmouth Guildhall. And uh, I, I really couldn't sort of get any friends that were interested in that kind of thing. But I, I got on this ferry and I, and I saw a couple of dudes with big parkers on, with like Gentle Giant written on and stuff. And actually turned out, latterly, about a year after that, I, I became friends with them. And that turned out to be Phil Gould and Boone Gould. You know, as we got older, I think I got to 18 or 19 years of age. I'd moved to London with, the, with the, uh, the old milk van that I used to drive around. That was very nice. I bought for 35 quid an old dormer bill. I mean, my impression of London was that it was just going to be absolutely chock-a-block full of the most amazing musicians. When you did go into the music shops, that far from seeing anyone famous, you know, you got the bums rush from the staff. Being rude, it's quite to see I specialise in, so I ended up getting a job in a music shop. And uh, that was, that was okay, I sort of worked there for a year or so. But in the meantime, Phil Gould had moved up to London and was studying at the Royal Academy of Music. He was doing it a much better way, really. So he was being able to study music all the time and was getting a grant for doing it. And then Boone moved up to London, not, not to a, a music, uh, college or anything but very much like myself just on the off chance of something happening and we were we didn't go up together at all but we did meet up in London and Phil introduced us to Mike Lindup who was uh, a guy that he met who was studying at the Guildhall School of Music as a percussionist. I met Mark for the first time on Oxford Street and I just bought a pair of Billy Cobham drumsticks because there were three drummers in the band at that time so we were all that was kind of our meeting point was talking about you know who's the best drummer and you know you know, whose licks do you want to copy and that kind of thing. We got on very well and after you know periods of time where we were doing nothing together at all really it, it sort of transpired that in 1979 we we did get together and jam at the Guildhall School of Music. Mike sort of flicks us to have a room of a Monday evening and we, we weren't, or we didn't sort of have any set instruments. The fact that Phil was up there and was playing drums and he had his drum kit more or less meant that, well, that he was going to be doing the drums then. You know, and he was a fantastic drummer anyway, so that, you know, that was sort of taking care of itself in that respect. Mike, his second instrument at college was uh, piano, so he was playing keyboards. And Mark was getting into the bass then, having played a bit of guitar and, you know, really sort of went for the kind of thumb style. The Americans were playing what was called slap bass. Um, which is, they were using their, their thumb, uh, not all of them, but uh, you know, the, the sort of some players were using their thumb to play in a percussive manner as opposed to what we'd all recognise as just being.